Hey everybody, this is Pastor Len and I am here today in Bel Air, Michigan. And um, when I was in Oberlin, Ohio, just some few weeks ago, I taught on this, but I wanted to uh, kind of rework it a little bit and bring it to your remembrance today. The Apostle Paul in the book of Colossians uses one of his protégés as an example to us of life in ministry. And, and it's a very uh, eye-opening look. So let's read uh, Colossians chapter 4 and verses 12 and 13. Paul says this, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. You know, that's my job as a five-fold ministry gift is to help you stand. And the word perfect means mature. And so when we're involved in a process of perfection, it's a process of maturing in the Lord and also complete in your ministry calling. Now, you might not be called to the five-fold ministry giftings, but you're called to serve the Lord. You're called to do something productive in the kingdom. And so he says, I greet you, uh, and Epaphras greets you, who's always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. We mature, we grow, and we take step by step into God's will for our lives. And Paul goes on to say, For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Now here's, there's four things that we can learn from Epaphras' life in ministry. Number one, we can learn that teamwork was the hallmark of Paul's ministry. Paul, the great apostle. Paul that wrote most of the New Covenant. Paul that touched the then known world with the gospel of Jesus Christ was constantly working in teams. It wasn't big I, little you with this great apostle. He worked with teams. He had team members such as Barnabas, Silas, Luke, and Timothy, and Epaphras, who we're going to talk about here today. Here's some things that you and I can learn from Epaphras' example. In chapter 1 of Colossians, in verse 7, Epaphras was shown to be persistent in ministry. And he teaches all of us, through his example, to be faithful in the Lord's work. To be faithful. You know, it's, it's not always easy to stay above discouragement when you work and you work and you try and you try and you don't see any visible results. But you know what? We need to keep faithfully being obedient to the call of God on our lives, even if the results are small or invisible, just knowing that a seed is being sown. Uh, you know, that's also sowing seed towards our faithfulness report, where God is concerned. Because when we want God to look down on us and say, Len Paxton was faithful. It doesn't mean... You know, it doesn't matter so much Len Paxton preached to millions. We're actually starting our fourth million uh, on internet ministry right now. But that doesn't matter. What matters is when I had two people that listened to my ministry or five people, uh, I preached it like I am today. To be faithful, to be persistent in ministry. Epaphras was, and he taught us to be so uh, by his example. Also, uh, we need to be faithful in our ministry year after year in the same ministry, because that's what we're called to, not just rising up to an occasion in a time of need and then they don't hear from you anymore. Weariness also never stopped Epaphras. He fought through every single possible reason to quit, but he did not quit. He continued in his calling. Also in chapter 1 of Colossians in verse 8, we see from Epaphras to be precise in our communication. Paul wrote one of the greatest books in the Bible and he effectively spoke uh, his teaching to a community of believers that was based on what he learned from Epaphras communication to him. 
So when we're communicating situations to others, we want to make sure we're accurate. So minister, listen to me. Avoid assumption. Avoid presumption. Avoid uh, putting your take on a situation and report the facts of the gospel to the people and be precise in your communication. So, for, so we have persistent in ministry, precise in communication, and also in chapters 4, verses 12 and 13, we find out that Epaphras was passionate in prayer. He prayed always, the Bible says. He prayed fiercely. The Bible uses the word laboring. He, put, he prayed fervently. And for a great definition and, and, and another verse to look at on that, check out Romans 12, 11, and check out James 5, verse 16. And finally, Epaphras prayed factually. How do you do that? You pray the Word of God. You find yourself becoming, as we read to you from the text, complete in the will of God. And the more complete you grow into the will of God, this isn't something that, you know, some people are just complete and others don't have it. No, all of us grow into that completeness. And as we grow into that completeness, we begin to pray the will of God more. When we start out, we might be praying our will. We might be praying, Lord, help me prayers. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you need help, cry out to Jesus, hallelujah, because he wants to help you. But the more mature that we become and the more complete we become in the will of God, then the more when we pray the word, we understand the direction of Holy Spirit in that prayer and he brings these answers to pass. The way that Epaphras agonized over the Colossian believers describes a person who works in the gospel until they are exhausted. Hallelujah. And there's nothing wrong with that. We often think of exhaustion in our culture today as a bad thing. However, God said, I have a rest for my people. So we can work, 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 work in the gospel and still be walking in the rest of the Son of God. Amen? And so working hard is a good thing. Epaphras was a hard worker, often until the point of exhaustion. And fourthly, the fourth thing that we can learn from his example in this text is that we are to be particular about people. And I want to say this again, I've been, I've been bearing down on it a lot lately in the messages. There is a lie in the church right now, there is a lie among ministries right now that says, you know, I really love God, but I can't stand the people. That's a lie. Your love for God is measured by your love for people. And we don't ever want to forget that. Epaphras' example teaches us to be particular about people. We can't pray fervently for people unless we have a zealous love for them. The better we know people, the better we can pray for them. And that's why, you know, going to that local church is important. That's why community is important. Because the better we know people, the better we can pray for them. And the more that we love them, the more that we will pray for them. You see, God looks at the motivation of my heart. So, there have been times in my life where I'd think, you know, well, so-and-so, you know, I, I don't really like them. They did me wrong, whatever the case might be. But I'm just going to go ahead and obey Jesus, and I'm going to pray for them, and that's good. You should do that. But God looks at my heart and He can see that there's something there that's keeping me from praying fervently for them on fire in the Holy Ghost to see a mighty mountain moved in their life. And so when we don't allow those things to be in our heart and, and, and we pray for those who despitefully use us and we pray for an enemy and we pray with the real zeal and fire of the Holy Spirit, with a burning love for that person. And the reason that we might be hurt is not because of what they did, but we're hurt because we aren't walking in harmony together. That puts a different perspective on that prayer. We learn that from the ministry example of Epaphras in the Word of God. So ladies and gentlemen, and this came out a little bit differently than it did in Oberlin, today but I want you to remember these points 
especially those of you who are working in your local church, who are helping your pastor, who are helping leadership. I want you to be persistent in ministry. I want you to be precise in your communication. I want you to be passionate in prayer. And I want you to be particular about people. Because as you are, you will find revival beginning to break out in your circles. I also want to take this moment of time to tell you where I got this material today. It's from the David Jeremiah Study Bible. I'm holding my copy right here. And uh, it's a Bible that I highly recommend for all of my friends. It's a great read and some awesome, awesome material contained in it. So as we go forward from here, uh, Angie and I have a real heart to continue to connect with local bodies of believers. And we want to see ministries that are submitted to pastoral authority and who are emanating directly from a local church. And so we're looking forward to meeting up with you out there, to sharing some times of fellowship. Come on out wherever we are, if you're in the area, and make some videos with us. We would love to put your testimony on tape. We would love to air it around the world, literally through the internet. And we would love for people to... Let's just fill up the internet with Jesus. Amen. As I said, we're on our fourth million uh, people who we've reached through the ministry in the last decade through the internet. Come on out and share your testimony with us and possibly a brief teaching or whatever the case might be. So from Bel Air, Michigan, on a beautiful sunny July day, this is evangelist Len Paxton saying, go with God and he will go with you. Bless you.